Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Fleck, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled ADHD and Sex, Building Focus and Attention for Intimacy. Leading today's presentation are Drs. Ari Tuckman and Stephanie Sarkis. Dr. Tuckman is a psychologist and sex therapist based in Westchester, Pennsylvania. He is the author of four books, including ADAD, ADHD After Dark, Better Sex Life, Better Relationship, and host of the podcast, More Attention, Less Deficit. He also serves as co-chair of the CHAD Conference Committee. Dr. Sarkis is a psychotherapist, a licensed and board-certified mental health counselor, and a Florida Supreme Court certified family and civil mediator based in Tampa. She's the host of the Talking Brains podcast and author of numerous books, including Healing from Toxic Relationships. Today's webinar will address barriers to intimacy and how to manage different sex drives among couples, as well as other issues that affect relationships touched by ADHD. We'll also share insights from Dr. Tuckman's survey of ADHD adults and their non-ADHD spouses. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking this poll question to our live audience. What are you looking to improve on when it comes to sex and intimacy in your relationship? Please select your answers and comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. For answers to common webinar questions about slides, transcripts, and certificates of attendance, click on the FAQ tab of your webinar screen. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 460 to access the webinar resources. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. Our summer issue is full of great advice from experts, including Drs. Tuckman and Sarkis, so sign up for Attitude Magazine today for yourself or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Click the magazine tab on your screen to learn more. You can also learn more about how ADHD affects relationships in Attitude's latest ebook, The ADHD Relationship Guide. It features expert advice from Dr. Sarkis and Tuckman and others about how to navigate dating, marriage, sex, and rejection sensitivity. Click the link on screen or visit attitudemag.com slash shop for details. <clears throat> so without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Drs. Ari Tuckman and Stephanie Sarkis. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading this discussion. All right, thank you, Carol, for um, that great introduction and inviting us here. So um, my good friend Stephanie and I are gonna talk about how to have a better relationship in that you know, for most romantic relationships, part of that means having a good sex life. And long ago, I kind of came across this line and it's really sort of influenced me that a good relationship is one that pushes you to become a better person. And it's definitely not always fun and it's definitely not always pretty, but it's kind of the only way that it happens. Um, in the sense that um, the people that you're closest to, they're the ones who have the most at stake in terms of what you do. And that's mostly a good thing, right? They want you to become a better person, but also relationships involve their challenges. And as a relationship develops and it grows and life becomes more complicated and stresses increase, it becomes that much more important to respond well to those challenging, difficult situations. So, um, you know, a good relationship then is one that pushes you to grow and to develop and to learn and to kind of become that better person. Now, if you want to continue to have sex with someone for, you know, the years and the decades, not just, you know, the days and the weeks, um, then you'd also need to work on becoming a better person, right? Because sex is often one of the th first things to go when a couple isn't getting along well. So um, that's sort of our main point here, or at least our main theme is that we want to kind of share ways to continue to become a better person in your relationship and in your sex life and how to improve both of them. Um, 
so let me see, how do I get to the next slide here? Um, so, <clears throat> you know, one of the universal challenges for any busy couple is that too much of your time goes into the stuff that you kind of got to do and too little time is left over for the stuff that you want to do. Um, and, you know, that's true in general for any busy couple, but, you know, if there's some ADHD in the mix or whatever other things, but, you know, if there's some ADHD in the mix, if it's not being well managed, then it makes it even easier for too much time to go to this stuff that you have to do and not enough time is then left over for the stuff that you want to do. Um, or maybe there is some time, but there's no longer the good feeling is to use the time, at least with your partner, right? So if the person who's under functioning isn't doing their part, the other partner is gonna be angry and resentful. Um, on the flip side of that, if you've got your partner kind of barking at you all the time, you're probably not feeling that interested in hanging out with them. So, you know, all that good positive benefit that comes from, you know, enjoying time together kind of starts to trickle out of the relationship. So because of this, then as busy as you are, hopefully the relationship is not the least important part of your life. Um, but when we make our partner the thing that happens last, it does kind of send the message that the relationship is less important than every other thing. So how do we carve out at least some time to spend together and to enjoy each other? So, you know, I'll sometimes have clients in my office or on my video screen, as it were, say, oh, you know, we don't really have any of the same interests anymore. We don't really like doing the same stuff, right? As if like that's then the end of the discussion. And the way that I usually kind of think about it is that basically like I don't buy it, right? I don't believe that you guys can't have, have some things that you can do together. Maybe it's not, you know, the favorite TV show that you would want to watch, but there's got to be some show that you both like well enough that you can watch it together. Or if it's about, I don't know, going on a bike ride together, right? And someone says like, well, but, you know, they bike too slow. It's not a good workout. Okay, but is your agenda to get a good workout or is your agenda to spend some time together? Like, what are you trying to do there? You know, so. um so sometimes it does take some work to find something that can be fun and enjoyable and connecting, but that's okay. Sometimes it takes work to have fun. That's kind of a part of life. Um, so put in the effort, find the things to do that are fun, and then make sure that they are fun. And part of that means no shop talk. Like, don't talk about the kids. Don't talk about problems. Don't talk about things that you need to figure out. Like those are also important to have, but that's not now. Um, it also means show up in a good mood. And if you're not in a good mood, try to get yourself into a good mood. Um, that might also mean doing the prep work before to actually be in a good mood, meaning making sure you get enough sleep, making sure that you're not scrambling to the last minute um, so that then, you know, your head is somewhere else. So, you know, investing the, the time and the energy to make it a positive experience. Um, so, you know, as uh, Carol said, some of what we're going to be talking about here today is based on a survey I did, which ultimately became ADHD After Dark. But um, one of the findings from the survey, which has been found by lots and lots of researchers before, is that there's a really strong correlation between general relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction, that the happier you are in one of those, probably the happier you're going to be in the other one. There's also a weaker correlation with sexual frequency, meaning if you're happy in a relationship and you're happy when you, if you enjoy the sex you're having, probably you want to have it more, but also more isn't better. More bad sex doesn't actually improve your relationship. It kind of makes it worse. Um, but it makes sense when you think about it, right? If you want to have good sex with your partner, if you want them to be there and happy about it, you got to behave well when you guys are not having sex. But also, 
you know, hopefully if you're smart, if, you know, when you're having good sex, you're then behaving better before and after as well, right? All of this ties together. Um, so the fact that these are so intertwined was really the rationale for me to do the survey, to write the book. And now why, why we're having this conversation is that I kind of felt like the sex part of relationships was really kind of being ignored by the folks who are kind of writing and presenting on ADHD. And yet it's such an important part of relationships. It can definitely make our relationships better when things are going well, and it can really make our relationships worse when it's not going well. So one of the, I mean, I found a lot of different stuff in the survey, but one of the things that came out, which was, I thought really interesting completely predictable, but I didn't predict it. Um, but was that it's a sort of what I call the ADHD sexual eagerness cluster, which is that um, when I looked at the survey results and I looked at any of the questions that had anything to do with kind of a greater desire for or kind of like more easily convinced um, to be sexual, is that the folks with ADHD rated themselves higher on 10 out of 12 of them, and then they tied on the other two. The non-ADHD partners didn't rate higher on any of the 12. So those with ADHD then rated themselves higher on desired sexual frequency, at least for the women. For the guys, it was pretty similar. Um, higher masturbation frequency, um, a higher porn use frequency, as well as more positive feelings about their partner's porn use. Um, at least the women rated themselves as kinkier. Um, there's also a, a greater history of infidelity, both sort of like physical hookups as well as more emotional affairs. Um, there's also a, a greater desire for, as well as a history of, of having participated in consensually non-monogamous activities. So um, in general then, folks with ADHD seem to have, um, I don't know, be be more sort of interested in sexual experiences, seem to be more sort of influenced by sexual stimuli, which completely makes sense, right? Hopefully sex is interesting and it's, um, you know, easy to then be sort of, I don't know, turned on or interested by it. Um, in general though, men rated themselves higher on most of these things than the women did. So. ADHD had a big effect, but frankly, gender had at least a big, as big of an effect. All right, Steph, that's your slide. Okay, thanks, Ari. So one of the things that helps is make the most of the treatment options that are available. We have several treatments that are acceptable for ADHD that have been shown effective uh, to be effective over long-term longitudinal studies, decades of research at this point. And uh, we know that the most effective treatment overall is stimulant medication. I know that there is a treatment uh, a stimulant shortage right now. Um, hopefully that'll alleviate um, in the near future. Uh, but stimulant medication is the most effective. Also, we have non-stimulant medication, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, couples therapy, of course. Uh, the more the better. So it, the way the treatments work is that they're synergistic. So when you have medication and counseling together, there's more of an impact than if you have either one by themselves. So layer on your treatments. So also, if things aren't working out, if you feel that the treatment's not working well, if you feel that the medication isn't working as well as maybe it should, you're not reaching optimal uh, satisfaction with it, talk to your therapist, talk to your prescriber, and also seek experts if necessary. Seek counsel. You can always get a second opinion on things. But what we want to do is we want to get you to the point where you feel like you're working to the, to the best of your potential. Because one of the things I think we face as people with ADHD is a loss of potential that we're not where we want to be. We know we could get to X point, but we're not quite getting there. And that impacts sex life. That impacts how we feel about ourselves, which, which definitely impacts sex life. So remember, this isn't about ADHD. It's about relationship and sexual happiness. And managing life is better for foreplay. So um, it's also something where, again, seek your treatment. Be uh, consistent with your treatment. If you need to use a pill container so you remember to take your medicine every day, Studies have shown that taking your stimulant medication every day is the most effective form. So not taking a drug holiday or weekends. Obviously, there's exceptions to that. If your prescriber says, hey, 
uh, you've been losing weight, you need to not take it on weekends. That's something else. But overall, uh, studies have found that take, staying on your stimulant medication every day is the most effective way. Because ADHD doesn't just impact work and school. It impacts how you are with your family and how you are with friends and how you are with the community. And of course, that goes into self-esteem, self-concept, and it makes a difference in how you interact with your partner. And it makes a huge difference in your sex life. So people that, that feel that their partner puts more effort into managing their ADHD are more comfortable with making sexual requests, fulfilling their partner's requests, and sharing fantasies. There's a big piece of communication that has helped when you get effective treatment. Part of that is our executive functions in the frontal lobe include reconstitution of information. So what we're thinking and then what we say can be two different things. So it really helps to have a partner say, hey, is this kind of what you meant by that? And to re-clarify, that's a big step of having effective communication. I know that everybody comes from different backgrounds and comfort levels with talking about sex, but the studies show, especially Ari's study shows, that the more you talk about it, the more comfortable you feel about it, the better sex you're going to have. So people that feel that their partner puts more effort into managing ADHD has 67% more sex, 92 versus 55 times a year. So you might be interested in that number too, 92 versus 55 times, because I see couples uh, they can have very different ideas of how often they want to have sex. Um, and I usually hear that, well, you know, I think most people are having sex every day. So if you look at, you know, this many times a year and divide them how many days there are in a year, um, it really gives people a more realistic idea of what the, what the kind of national average is. So also when your partner makes effort, you know, like Ari said, we're more likely to extend effort as well. So it becomes a nice synergistic effect. So, and, and Ari says, you're managing ADHD is an aphrodisiac, which I totally agree with, because you're practicing good self-care, which also translates into care of your relationship, care of your partner. So most people want more sex than what they're getting. So again, the couples that see me, uh, sometimes I have a person that says, I want sex every day. Uh, most people want sex around two to four times a week on average. Uh, the actual frequency is about 1.1 to 1.4 times a week. Now you may wonder what one point, you know, what's point one of sex or 0.4, so that's all averages. Uh, but uh, overall, that's what people aim for. Now, there are life things. There are kids. There's work. There's you're tired. There's you're sick. So there's all sorts of reasons why you may not be getting that two to four times a week. So sometimes I, I tell couples to schedule time. Yeah, it may not be the most spontaneous thing. You can be spontaneous once you get to that you know, date that you're having, but schedule time. And when couples uh, tell me, well, we don't have time, I, I tell them there's always time for sex. You can find a way um, because then you have to look at, well, you're saying you don't have time for sex, but what's this really about? So you can always find time for sex. So how much happier would most couples be if they're having sex four times a week? You know, what are you willing to, to do to get there? Uh, what are you willing to invest of yourself? What are you willing to invest in time in your relationship to get to that frequency? And you know, like Ari said, you know, more isn't necessarily better. Uh, so it's the communication point and being able to communicate and express yourself and be transparent about your needs and wants and doing that in a safe space where you feel like your partner's going to listen and not judge, that really makes a huge difference on how often you're gonna have sex and the quality of that sex. So out of 25 potential barriers or bare sex life, the five smallest related to sexual enjoyment, the nine biggest related to too little time, energy, or too many bad feelings. So uh, sexual enjoyment you know, isn't as much of a big deal as we might think it is. Uh, sometimes people feel like they need to reach orgasm and satisfaction uh, in sex life. A lot of people feel that they don't need to reach orgasm for a satisfying sexual experience. So that makes a huge difference. I think sometimes people uh, can get very focused on you know, the end result rather than sharing that time together. Uh, so the biggest issues are, again, you know, having too little time or energy. And that's where Ari said sleep is a huge factor uh, in making sure that you are uh, you're, you know, up for the challenge, so to speak, uh, and also getting the treatment that you need. And we really need to look at self-care, doing proactive self-care, which means that taking care of yourself before there gets to be a crisis, doing something for yourself every day, uh, self-compassion, treating yourself like your own best friend, not waiting until there's a crisis to take care of yourself, which is what we call reactive self-care. Proactive self-care is, is so helpful. And you know, knowing that your partner's taking good care of themselves is a turn-on for a lot of people. So 
Uh, you'll probably enjoy it if you can start. Sometimes desire follows activity. Sometimes with ADHD, just motivation. If we wait till we're motivated, the thing's not happening, whether that's sex or, or you know, doing work. So sometimes we just have to start doing it and then we get into it. So uh, sometimes we just have to go ahead and do the action and the motivation will follow. Because again, ADHD is not a disorder of attention because we can hyper-focus when we need to. Uh, but it's a disorder of motivation. So again, do the thing and then the desire follows. So also what gets in the way for you, not just immediately, but also before that and, and before that. So are there issues with trauma that you may need to resolve in therapy? Uh, are there issues with communication in other areas? Do you need to maybe seek the counsel of another therapist just to get a second opinion? Are there uh, Feelings of guilt and shame related with sex, which can happen for many people, depending on, on what your family of origins view were of sex or, or religious beliefs. So it's something to talk about in therapy. What is what are the roadblocks that you're getting to? Because you deserve to have a good sex life and to and to have healthy sexuality. So ADHD squeezes out time for sex. So uh, we know that with having ADHD, we are to have we are doing 500 things at once, even more on effective medications. So uh, ADHD exacerbates that time crunch for busy couples. So uh, kids are not. You can be working uh, many hours. You've got household stuff to take care of, pets. Again, kids add another, obviously another huge layer to that. Time isn't used efficiently. Tasks get pushed back later in the night. If you don't have a booster dose of stimulants, your stimulants may be wearing off maybe at three or four in the afternoon. So you're spending the rest of the afternoon and into night without any stimulant coverage for your ADHD. And again, that's called a booster dose. When you get a low dose of immediate release stimulant to help you through you know, the end of the workday and then into the evening, and it should wear off before bed. Again, you want to talk to your prescriber about that because people differ. So uh, also unbalanced workloads lead to fatigue or lack of time. That can be an unbalanced workload at work. It can be an unbalanced workload at home where you feel like you're doing a majority of the chores and that leads to resentment. And if you don't talk about that stuff, that bleeds into sex life. So it may be that you know, you're engaged in sex, but you're thinking about how much you know your, your spouse didn't help unload the dishwasher. Uh, and that builds up resentment and, and we can get passive aggressive. That's the nature of people, right? Is that's passive aggressive is the, the thing where someone says, you know, how are you doing? And you're slamming the pots and pans down. you're going, I'm fine when we know that you're not, right? So that's passive aggressive behavior. So it's really important that we speak out and say, hey, I'm, I'm having an issue of, you know, if I could have a little more help with unloading the dishwasher, that would be super great. Um, it's approaching things with just uh, a gentle kindness, but also an assertiveness, so stating your needs. And again, um, I've mentioned this before in talks I've done that when you set a boundary, the way someone responds to a boundary doesn't mean you didn't have a right to set that boundary. It says a lot about your partner, though, when you're doing what I call a low ask, like, can you help out with a dishwasher, and you get a really abrasive response. That's about your partner, not about you. And so that's something, again, to talk about in individual or couples therapy. Uh, so when you have a time crunch, it makes it harder to mentally transition to sex and to relax. And Ari's study found this more so for women. Uh, also, sex can be a powerful motivator to use earlier time well. So we do really well with rewards with ADHD. So use sex as a reward. You know, oh, if I get this done and this done, then we'll have sex. And hey, that's a great payoff. So scheduling, flirting with your partner. Um, if you're not sure how to flirt, think about how you flirt with your partner in the beginning of your relationship. I always ask people, you know, what did you find attractive about the person when you first met them? How did you meet? What did you love about that person? What really excited you about that person? Because the flip side of that is the stuff that drives us nuts. So, so really look at what first attracted you to your partner. Because those qualities are still there. It's just that the nature of human relationships is the romantic phase wears off and thing, things start getting real. So we need to look back at that romantic phase. What was it that you really liked about your partner? What excited both of you? And kind of revisit that and talk about that. Um, anticipation. People with ADHD, anticipation can be a big motivator. And just simmering it, keep it going, uh, kind of flirting throughout the day, building up to sexual activity later. Uh, also, with missed opportunities, look at your time management. Are there time blocks where maybe I'm not making this a priority? It's first putting your self-care as a priority and then your relationship. And again, you know, part of a healthy relationship is having a, a healthy sex life, whatever that means for everybody. And that could mean different things to different people, but it's, it has to do with, are you satisfied with, with the sex you're having? Is your partner satisfied? And look at it as the, is the two of you against the issue, not the two of you against each other.
Also, inconsistency of ADHD. ADHD is a disorder of inconsistency. We can be on the ball one day, not on the ball the next day, and there's really no rhyme or reason to it. Different expectations. Um, I know that Ari's spoken several times about letting go of expectations in a relationship, and that tends to make things go much smoother and we appreciate each other more. Because if we set up an idea of, oh, they need to meet this bar, this bar, and this bar, and someone doesn't reach that, everybody loses. But if you go into it with maybe boundaries, but not expectations, you tend to appreciate each other more, which leads to better sex. Uh, also, there can be some nagging that happens. There can be avoidance. Um, avoidance can also include, I don't want to talk about this with my partner because I'm afraid of being rejected or having fears of abandonment. But again, that's a that's a partner issue. If you're bringing up a concern you're having and you're doing it in a, in a calm loving, kind way, then the way your partner responds is not about you, it's about them. And that's something that, again, you can talk about in couples therapy, or again, you can talk about individual therapy. So again, it's the two of you against the issue, not the two of you against each other. I mean, you need to address ADHD, but there's other things too. That doesn't just mean the ADHD needs to be worked on. It could be that your partner has some issues to work on as well. Uh, so if your partner says, well, ADHD is the whole issue, again, that's an issue more with your partner rather than with you, uh, because everybody's got their stuff, whether it's ADHD or something else. And whenever you, uh, you go to get treatment, so if you get medication treatment, therapy treatment, or both, uh, things will change. Now, sometimes that changes your relationship dynamic, and sometimes that means you decide that it's better if you part. Sometimes it increases your connection, and relationships are dynamic. There are going to be times where you feel closer to your partner or further away to your partner, and that's something just to be aware of. So you can be where you want to be with your partner at that time. So uh, also we start accepting each other better when we start letting expectations go, not looking at what this person, what we think they should be, but accepting them as they are. So now I'll kick it over to Ari. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, when we talk about somebody's sex life, often what we're referring to is the stuff that they do with somebody else. But I think it's important then, whoops. Um, oh, did I go on slide just, too many? We, yeah, 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 there you go. Okay, um, so, all right, I'll back up a bit. Um, so, you know, there I saw there's some questions in the chat about kind of different, what's called desire discrepancy, which means that the two people in the couple don't have the same desires at the same times. This is incredibly common that, you know, the desired frequency between the two partners is not exactly the same. This is maybe not so much in the first months, but certainly as like normal life begins to settle in, that one partner wants sex more often than the other partner. Um, totally normal. It's a thing that couples have to deal with, but couples have to deal with having different desires on lots and lots of different things. So it's hardly unique in that way. But um, because this is a common thing, and at least at the level of group averages, perhaps more so an issue when it's the guy in a heterosexual couple that has ADHD, um, compared to in a heterosexual couple when the woman has ADHD, it's important to be able to kind of resolve that difference, right? What do we do when one person wants sex and the other person doesn't? So one of the things that was really kind of important that I found in the survey is that the couples that were the happiest, that the folks who are the happiest in their relationship and with their partner, were much more willing to be sexually generous, to kind of do something for their partner when they were in the mood, when they themselves were not in the mood. Um, so what do you do? I mean, maybe it's the sort of like the full production, whatever that means for you guys. Maybe it's something else, right? Like, let's talk about it. It doesn't have to be the entire, you know, whole thing. Maybe there's some other stuff you can do. Maybe you can lend a hand, so to speak. Maybe you give permission, you know what? I'm out, but you go take care of you. Um, maybe there's a rain check, which doesn't mean some vague at some point. It means, no, actually, like, let me think about it. Yeah, tomorrow, actually, let's let's do it tomorrow in the morning or whatever. Um, and that just in general, good deeds tend to be rewarded, whether that's good deeds that happen in bed, good deeds that happen outside of the bedroom. So the question then that I would sort of pose to you to think about is, you know, what would it take to earn some generosity from your partner? What would it take to give some generosity to your partner? 
right? Because good relationships have a lot of generosity, right? There's a feeling of fairness. There's a feeling of, of you know, things go both ways. So we want to promote that kind of generosity. Um, as I started saying, um, not all sex involves somebody else. Sometimes, you know, for most people, part of their sex life is stuff that they do by themselves. Um, you know, there's this idea that some people have that, you know, masturbating is second rate. It's not as good as the real thing um, in that only people who are unhappy with their sex life or unhappy with their partner masturbate. Obviously, that's a pretty narrow view. Hopefully, that's more of an older view. Um, you know, reality is there are people who have very satisfying sex lives with their partner who also sometimes do stuff on their own. And if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. Um, so I think that on the one hand, I think I would say, personal opinion, right, we all have a right to self-pleasure, right? Like you're not obligated to share all of your sexual energy with your partner. On the other hand, especially if you're in a monogamous relationship, I think it's reasonable that your partner doesn't use up all their sexual energy by themselves in that, you know, your shared experience is also important. So, um, so if you're happy in your sex life and your partner is also masturbating sometimes, I don't know if that's a thing that you need to be worked up about. And if you're masturbating, I don't know that that's a thing that you need to feel guilty about. Now, having said that, there are folks at the other end of the spectrum where they're not happy in their shared sex life. And in that case, they're using masturbation as sort of a substitute for what they're not doing with their partner. On the one hand, that can eliminate a lot of fights, so that's a positive. On the other hand, it could also be sort of a path of least resistance, right? You kind of go, you take care of yourself quietly, and then you don't have to address the bigger, harder issues that are getting in the way of greater relationship um, happiness and greater sexual happiness with your partner. So again, another question to ponder here is, you know, what role is masturbation playing in your relationship? Is it generally positive or at least neutral? Or is there a negative aspect to it? And then back to you. Okay. So now we'll talk about porn. Now, this can be a controversial topic. Uh, it really depends on how you feel as a couple. Uh, some people like to watch porn together. One person can be okay with the other person watching porn, but maybe they don't prefer it. Or it could be that one partner resents when their partner watches porn, or it could be both of you aren't interested. I think it really has to do with what you both agree to is, is acceptable in your relationship. Uh, and the happiest couples feel more positive about their own and their partner's porn use. Um, there are different types of porn, different things that you might be interested in. It might be that your partner is not interested in something you're interested in. And that speaks to Ari's generosity piece, which is if it's something that maybe you're not into, you're not offended by, but you're not into, but your partner is, maybe you could just go ahead and participate because your partner enjoys it and then lends itself to ultimately having a better sex life. Uh, but if you feel bad about your partner's porn use or your porn use, so you may have guilt or shame associated with that based on you know, family of origin or belief systems, um, then it's really important to address that in, in uh, individual therapy or couples therapy or talk about it in your relationship. It may be that your attitude towards porn has changed. You're either feeling uh, less comfortable with it or more comfortable with it. And again, that leads to the good communication. And when we have good communication, other parts of our relationships, it tends to lend itself to good communication about sex. So I, I recommend that couples do a kind of a scheduled arguing where they meet once a week for a half hour. Uh, uh, one person picks a topic and let's not do you know hot topics in the beginning. It could be let's change a cell phone company. And so each person talks for 10 minutes about their point. And then for the rest of the time, you spend time coming up with a solution or you agree to disagree. And the rules are that you don't call each other names. You don't bring up past stuff, no matter how relevant you think it is. And if you have to take a step away because you're getting worked up about something, say, I'm going to be back in 10 minutes and then take a break and always come back. So when you schedule those kinds of arguments, it's interesting how much other stuff falls into place. That communication overall, when we practice really listening to each other, not interrupting and not bringing up the past, how it lends itself to open communication in other areas. So consider that, that work on the communication skills and sometimes talking about sex becomes even more uh, open, more transparent, and even sometimes enjoyable. 
So also um, agreements about porn need to be realistic and followed. So how can you set yourself up for success? We always want you to succeed. So what's a way that the two of you, again, can work together against the issue uh, to get to the point where you're feeling more comfortable with each other's use of porn? Or if one of you doesn't like using it, you know, maybe you can be okay with your partner using it as an auxiliary to your sex life. Uh, and if you feel like your partner is using it too much, you know, are there issues with impulsivity? Uh, people with ADHD sometimes can use more porn or other you know, substances uh, because of that need for dopamine, for raising dopamine. And treatment is one of those ways with medication and also therapy that people find that they are less dependent on other things or substances or other items uh, to feel okay. So again, if we're missing brain chemicals, we're going to find a way to replace them whether they realize it or not. And getting effective treatment is a way that we don't rely on maybe unhealthy sources. And I don't mean that porn's unhealthy. It's just that overuse where you're cutting out talking to your partner or cutting out day-to-day -day living because of, of an issue with porn, that's something to talk about you know, with a therapist or with a couple's therapist. And again, getting adequate treatment for ADHD, optimal treatment rather. Uh, so we really need to be on the same page with our partner about this. And just because your partner likes porn doesn't mean likes to that use it as, as a stimulant or as part of masturbation does not mean that they don't care about you. It doesn't mean that they think lesser of you. It's just people like what they like. It's not a thing unless you make it a thing. Right. So, okay, oh, so last couple slides here. Um, you know, I've got this saying, like nothing in long-term relationships happens in a vacuum. Um, there is a, a hundred miles of road and history behind this present moment. This is why we can get into really big fights about really small, stupid things. It's because it's not just about this one thing that's happening right here. Um, now, the problem there is it's really easy if you're kind of talking to your friends about your relationship and your partner, it's really easy to justify whatever sort of bad behavior you engage in or whatever kind of shortcuts you might use by kind of building a case against your partner, right? Well, of course I didn't tell her about that money I spent. She freaks out and yells at me and whatever. Why would I tell her about, you know, whatever, right? So it's easy to justify the places that you sort of like take the easy route in your relationship, but, if we both justify, then nothing gets better, right? This is that hard work of becoming a better person. So, um, you know, I think ultimately then, even if your partner doesn't have any idea about what you're doing or this thing that you did, it's really about kind of being responsible to our own integrity and our own sense of who we want to be. Um, you know, so the question here then is, you know, how do you want to be in this relationship? Even when your partner is less than perfect, even when your partner doesn't sort of set you up to be successful, so to speak, it's easy to respond well when your partner is responding well first. Um, you know, how do you want to be? You know, what kind of a person do you want to be within this relationship? Um, I think there's also the question is, you know, is your behavior likely to work out well? So, if you come home from work and you're kind of grumpy and you're sort of withdrawn and you're not really helping out, if you want to have sex with your partner that night, is that going to work, right? Is that too much of, a, of an ask for them to be interested in fooling around if you've been kind of a jerk for most of the evening? Um, on the other hand, you know, if you behave better, what might you get back from your partner, right? You want them to set you up to be, to, kind of respond in the better way. How do you set your partner up to respond in better ways, right? Because again, this is a two person job. So all of this, I mean, this is just sort of relationship stuff in general, but I think it really becomes sort of focused and highlighted when we talk about a couple's sex life, because again, it's it can be one of the first things to go. And yet it's part of the glue that holds us together. It's part of what, builds those good feelings and that connection that makes it easier to kind of like weather the storms that life brings in sometimes hopefully mostly small and sometimes also in much bigger ways. So the question then to sort of ponder here at the end is, 
what kind of a person do you want your relationship to push you to become, right? And whether your motivation is about the relationship overall, whether it's about having a better sex life, whether it's about all of the above, right? What kind of a person do you want to become? So we have a whole lot of questions and we've got a good 20 minutes to get through as many of them as we can. So, um, so Carol, take over. What do, give us our questions here. <laughs> okay. Before we start the Q&A, I'd like to share the final results from today's poll question. What are you looking to improve on when it comes to sex and intimacy in your relationship? Here's what you said. 16% said initiating or maintaining sexual interest. Another 16% said managing differences in sexual desire and frequency. 15% said increased emotional connection. 14% said maintaining focus. 12% said improved communication. And 11% said scheduling and prioritizing time for intimacy. So now to our questions. Um, Ari, you talked about being generous with your partner, even when you're not in the mood, so to speak. Um, and so we have a lot of questions around when one person wants to put, postpone sex, um, but they're worried about their partner's rejection sensitivity. Um, how to say right now without generating anger or hurt feelings. Yeah. So, you know, this is a thing that's going to happen. And, you know, the fact that your partner is sensitive to rejection, I think it, it, it carries some responsibility on your part to deliver rejection in, I don't know, like a respectful or sensitive way. Right. So if you know your partner is more sensitive on this, say it nicely. But I think also the uh, the receiver has a responsibility to manage that those feelings kind of within themselves. And it might be that the best thing to do is to not in the heat of the moment, but to ask your partner when you're initiating and I'm not in the mood what is the best way for me to respond to you? Like how, what is the best way for you to hear that for me to say, thanks, but no thanks, right? Because I don't want to say it in a way that hurts you. And also I don't want to have sex. I don't want to have, if I feel pushed to do something I don't want to do, it's not going to be good for me. It's not going to be good for our sex life. It's not going to be good for you. And also, by the way, I have to assume you can tell when I'm not into it. So how do we do this so that a yes really means a yes? And, you know, then the other person has to find a way to manage that within themselves or to find an alternative, um, you know, maybe doing something on their own or giving a counter offer. Maybe there's some lesser involvement from their partner. But, you know, it, it really is kind of a, it's still a two person job at that point. Right. Um, Open communication is key. Yep. I think we'll probably say that several times during this webinar. Yep. Um, someone writes, I'm adventurous. This is probably due to ADHD's impact on intimacy, and my non-ADHD partner is not. How can we bridge this gap? So I think that, again, not an uncommon situation, right? We talked about desire discrepancy in terms of desired frequency. But there can also be a discrepancy between the specific types of activities that you would like to do. So, again, the big advice here is don't have this discussion in the heat of the moment. Have this discussion. I think this is Barry McCarthy who said this. The place to talk about sex is with your clothes on at the kitchen table, right? So, um, so let's talk about it. Why, why does this more adventurous sex, why is it so exciting to you? What does it mean to you to do it? What does it mean to you to not do it? What's it like when I say yes? What's it like to you when I say no, right? So your partner can really understand why this is important and interesting, which by the way, also means not making their own perhaps inaccurate guesses about what it means. Um, and then for the other partner to kind of share their same, you know, kind of answer some of the same questions, you know, what is it about it that's not interesting? What are their fears or concerns about it? Um, you know, what do they want out of your sex life? And to really kind of try to understand each other way before you get to the point of deciding what to do about it. 
in that often when couples kind of get tangled up, it's because they're both making a case at each other and neither person is really listening and trying to understand what the other person is saying. Okay. And I've worked with couples that have different interests and they decide that they are going to seek those interests elsewhere with complete consent. And that's something I think I've seen more and more that you know, sometimes your, your kink or your fetish isn't going to be the same one that your partner has. Uh, so sometimes, again, it's, it's whatever the two of you agree to. With that, I would say that have complete consent and have it even written down what your agreement is if one person is going to seek that fetish elsewhere. Because um, I do have couples that, that have done that. Uh, but you aren't going to match up on everything. And that's kind of also the exciting thing about a relationship too, is getting to know the other person and what they like. And like Ari said, maybe there's a middle ground that you can incorporate uh, your interests into something and maybe bring it down a couple notches where your partner's interested as well. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, part of relationships is you don't get everything you want. Hopefully you get enough that it's still good, but I mean, just this is like a stupid example, but, you know, since I got married, I watch a lot less movies that have people shooting each other and stuff blowing up. Right. So that has been a loss since I got married, but a minor one. So like everything else is way better than that. So, you know, like these are the choices that we need to make. Right. And you can make anything important, but then what becomes perhaps less important? Um, we have another question, and we have several versions of this question as well. How can we keep the spark, intrigue, and mystery going in our long-term relationship? I worry about my partner getting bored of me and me getting bored of them. Well, first, I, need to, I think we need to look at just the nature of human relationships. And this is for everybody, ADHD or not. The romantic phase of a relationship lasts from a maximum of six months to a year. Again, that's everyone, ADHD or not. Um, and the brain is set up like that. So we make more people, right? I mean, the brain's not stupid. We want to repopulate the world. So that's when you meet somebody and you have this instant connection and you're, you're like, oh, you're an axe murderer. We can totally deal with that. You know, let's just, let's take our clothes off. So I think we need to look at the fact that after that six months or a year, things start getting real. And, and it's normal to not have that much of a spark or be like rabbits, you know, after that period of time. So part of it is, is just keep in mind that we are always changing as individuals. We may have the same base personality, but there's always stuff we can learn about our partner. Now with ADHD, it may be that that six months to a year period ends a little earlier because we like novelty. But a lot of it's just asking questions of your partner. Um, there are a lot of websites will give really great questions for you to ask your partner about, you know, they're growing up or what their interests are. There's so many things we still don't know about our partner. And that's something that, that can keep things exciting is discovering something new. Uh, so you may need some prompts to help you with that uh, to get to know people. But it's very normal in, in a relationship to have that drop off romance. I think that it's been kind of normalized uh, in the media and movies. TV shows that you're supposed to have that kind of intense rabbit kind of stuff all the way through your relationship. And that's not the case. Uh, so first it's normalizing that relationships change over time. And so instead of a, a huge fire, maybe you have a spark or an ember and, you know, part of your relationship as you go on is, is built on a really uh, solid friendship, but you also have a lot of great stuff on top of that. Uh, so again, it's just realizing that that's the same for everyone. So it's, it's really, doing the work of discovering new things about your partner, finding a, an interest that you both have and getting to know people that way. It may also be too that sometimes relationships run their course and that's okay too, because you're, you'll both be okay. Uh, so it's just something that sometimes we just need to put in some more work to discover some, some novelty. Um, this question comes from a woman who says I'm single and dating, which doesn't allow time to build a sexual rapport with a new person. So when we're at my apartment and we're getting in the mood, I begin to think, did I clean the bathroom? Will I wake my roommate? How can I get over this? Yeah. I mean, this is not uncommon. It also doesn't mean there's a problem, right? It's just people have distracting thoughts. Um, so the, the key here is don't get tangled up in having distracting thoughts. Notice it let it go, bring yourself back to the moment. What's happening, what's going on, get back into your body, meaning what am not like up in your head and your thoughts, but into your body. What am I feeling? What does this feel like? What does that feel like? 
Who is this person in front of me? What's going on with them? Right. So really just trying to stay present and bring yourself back into the moment. Um, my partner cheated on me and we're working through it, but I still have trust issues, which affects our sex life. Any tips to move forward? I would say you guys need to keep working on what it's going to take to rebuild that trust and that it is a process and there's a temptation to just sort of quickly rush through and say, okay, there are enough of that, but that's not really a satisfying answer. And then it keeps coming back. So, you know, probably with a couples therapist, maybe with some individual therapists to really spend the time to understand like what happened with this infidelity? How did your partner talk themselves into feeling like this was okay? Um, you know, what was, you know, looking back in hindsight, were there red flags that you saw, but you talked yourself out of seeing, um, how have you guys responded? And, you know, really, like, how, how do you take this um, challenge, this, you know, unasked for opportunity to really sort of examine yourselves in the relationship? Um, there, there are couples where an infidelity breaks it and the, the couple is done or they're still together, but it's done. Um, and there are couples who really grow from it painfully and with a lot of work, but ultimately are better off for it. So you know, my hope for you is that you guys are able to kind of grow from it. And frankly, if your partner isn't growing from it, then I think that is a red flag you need to really kind of consider. So, um, you know, but I think that if you're both invested in the relationship, if you're both willing to do that work, then you can get to something better here. Um, I struggle with relationships and regulating sexual behavior. Sex is definitely a love language for me, but it has been interpreted as that's all I'm interested in. I could use some tips to make things better. It, it could be the people you're with, honestly. <laughs> I think <laughs> when we have different levels of interests, we have different sex drives. And I think you know, sexual compatibility is one of those things either you have or you don't. Um, and, and I think that it might be that maybe there's some time for communication beforehand. Uh, and if you're with somebody that says, well, you're just with me for sex, that's about the other person, not necessarily about you. Uh, so that's something to maybe talk about in therapy that maybe, uh, the type of person that you're finding, you, you may have a pattern of what, of a person that is withholding possibly. Um, it may be that there, again, there needs to be more open communication or feeling more comfortable with communication. Uh, or it could be that um, that uh, that you're having that reje that rejection sense of dysphoria, uh, and it's whether someone actually said that or do you feel like they're saying that? Because I think sometimes with ADHD we can read into what people are are thinking or feeling when that might not be the case. So I always recommend to clients to look at fact versus speculation. What did the person say or do, and what have we kind of created? Uh, so, but again, it could just be that the people you're with that just aren't matching you in sexual compatibility. Yeah. Um, someone writes, I'm in a long-term marriage. What's the best way to move forward when there's resentment because we have a parent child dynamic going on? Maybe the not, maybe the ADHD, maybe the non ADHD partner, you know, has to remind the ADHD partner to do things and they don't do things. And then it becomes what this person says is a parent child dynamic. Yeah. I mean, this, the quick answer is rebalance the relationship. So there's not a parent child dynamic. If there is, you will feel resentful. Like that is the right feeling to have when you feel like you're in a parent child dynamic. So, you know, some of this is about the, the partner with ADHD to kind of manage your ADHD more effectively and to sort of step up and be more of an equal partner in the relationship. Some of it's about the non-ADHD partner to kind of take a look at what are they asking for? Where can they be flexible? Um, you know, does it have to be the way that you would like it to be, right? Couples where nobody has ADHD also disagree on things. So, you know, that's not unique. Um, so, you know, I think it's really about 
each partner feeling like the other one is putting in effort. That if you have ADHD and you're not really doing anything about it, you don't really take your medication and you're expecting your partner to accommodate to it, I think that is unreasonable to ask. Um, on the other hand, if you're the non-ADHD partner and everything has to be done your way because you know you just feel like that's the right way and you want your partner to accommodate to that, I think that's also unreasonable to ask. So, you know, what is the balance here? What do we each ask of each other? Um, and you know, how do we set this up so that the partner with ADHD is putting in the effort that they need to put in um, and that the non-ADHD partner is noticing and giving some credit for it and is being flexible about the things that are less important to them. Um, now, there's a little bit of a nuance here, though, that I think is really important. Um, if the non-ADHD partner is doing an, it's sort of an excessive amount of reminding, then that's a, that's a parent-child dynamic. On the other hand, if a quick reminder spare, you know, gets you more of what you want, right? If a quick reminder is a lot less work than doing it yourself, then that's not parent-child dynamic. That's you taking care of yourself, right? Like that's a good investment. I would encourage you to do those kind of small reminders. Okay. Um Someone writes, how can I calm down enough to accept my partner's touch as something pleasurable and not something that's invading my space? I think it's important to look at what type of touch it is. Uh, if you have a sensory issue, sometimes a, a brushing touch can be a distracting or repetitive touch. So I think it's look at the different types of way that your partner touches you or locations. And maybe there's something that that you can both agree to feels better, or maybe it needs to be for a shorter period of time. For I, I know for a lot of my clients, having any kind of repetitive touch really kind of gets them out of that turned on space. Uh, so it's it's looking at um, you know, the sensory sensitivities that a lot of people with ADHD have, and again, knowing that that's a normal part of having ADHD, and working with your partner and trying out different things. You know that feels good, that doesn't feel good, and again, it also means that your partner. Uh, needs to be willing to uh, accept you saying that this isn't really what I need without taking it personally. That you can explain, you know, I just have some sensory stuff. It's got nothing to do with you, nothing to do with how I feel about you, but I'll let you know if this is a touch that feels good uh, or a touch that maybe we can change things up. And sometimes what you can do is if it's a touch that you feel is just being grating or, or just not feeling good to you, you can request some other touch instead. Instead of saying, no, I don't like that, Say what instead what you would like instead and and just explore a little bit and figure out maybe there are some things you haven't tried yet before that feel good and just know that's a very normal part of ADHD. Um, I have a couple questions that are um, similar to this one, which is how can I increase my interest in sex? So I think first of all, you need to think about what actually would make sex more interesting to you, you know, when what what kind of sexual experiences or what's the lead into it? Um, what is the context around it? Like what needs to be happening in the relationship for you to feel more interested in sex? So, if, so getting clear inside your own head about what would get you there. Um, I think it's also important to know that there are a lot of people, men and women, who have more of what's called a responsive sexual desire, meaning that their desire responds to some sort of sexual activity rather than the spontaneous sexual desire is more sort of just out of nowhere, I'm feeling kind of horny and I'm interested. So a responsive sexual desire is completely normal. There's nothing wrong with it. And once a relationship has been around for a while, people, some people will settle into that more responsive desire that it's more a thing of kind of like being willing to be convinced. Don't do what you don't want to do. Don't be coerced. Don't let yourself be pressured, but be open to being convinced, just like we are open to being convinced about like, hey, do you want to watch this movie? I think it's pretty good. Meh. No, seriously, it's got Ben Affleck in it. He's great. Or I don't know. Right. So like that, w that being willing to see where it goes and you may find that like, actually, you know what? Yeah, I'm kind of liking this. This is good. But you always have to be able to have an exit. You always have to be able to say, you know what? 
this has been fun, but I think I'm done here. And your partner has to be willing to take that well enough. And the reason to take it well enough is you're not going to let them start down the road next time if you're worried you're going to get a bad reaction to it, right? So, um, but this is normal stuff. Um, so, you know, having those conversations with your partner about here are the things that you can do to get me in the mood, not just right before things happen, but, you know, we talked about this earlier that like managing your life better is foreplay. So what's the other stuff that needs to happen in the day or in the week in order for you to be perhaps more easily convinced? Okay. Well, unfortunately, that has to be our last question because we're out of time. But Drs. Tuckman and Sarkis, thank you so much for joining us today and for contributing your expertise to our ADHD community. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. And thanks to today's listeners. We hope to see you again next week for our free webinar on how the perception of ADHD in the classroom has evolved over the years and how schools are still failing, falling short in addressing students' needs. Make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters, our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.